So good morning, everyone. It is so great to see all of you. There's such a great uh, representation of people here today coming from all across the world, which is great because this is GBATnet. So welcome and good morning. I'm so excited to present our speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Aaron Corcoran, coming in all the way from Colorado, which is pretty early there today. But I think we have people different types of time zones. So whether it's early or whether it's late for you, yeah. to uh, welcome to the talk today. And just a little bit of housekeeping and upkeep. The uh, webinar series, if you cannot stay for the full session today, we do record these sessions and they are later posted in both PDF format and on YouTube uh, later on. So those will be posted probably by no later than the end of the week on YouTube. And they will also be in a PDF fashion available on the website as well. So feel free if you can't stay today the whole time or if you know people like to tune in, please direct them to those different outlets. Uh, as And all of our other webinar talks are also posted online. So if you want to go back and see some, feel free to access. And when it comes to our talk for next month, I'm very excited to say that our, our next speaker is going to be Caitlin Campbell, and she will be talking to us about how to use stable isotopes and stable isotope analysis for studying bats. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Dr. Aaron Corcoran, coming from Colorado, and he will be giving his talk today, The Acoustic World of Bats, Sonar Jamming, Stealth, and Silence. So go ahead and take it away, Aaron. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's always so fun to, to get to geek out and share um, the research I've been working on, you know, a, a lot of this dates back decades now and uh, has evolved over the years, as you will will see. Um, for our participants, um, please, if you have questions, uh, that would be awesome if you can drop those in the chat. I do like to make these a little bit more interactive. So I have an outline, um, but I'm happy to kind of deviate from that and or fill in the gaps uh, as people have questions. So um let's see here all right and laura is asking a, a question of where we can find pdfs for this so um today uh, as this is my field for dummies i i know you're all are not dummies but um a, a basic overview of the concepts instead of diving really deep into the graphs and all that stuff if you want to see uh, the actual publications on which this talk is based, all of it is published, and you can see those links at my website, sonarjamming.com. Uh, you can actually, you can also check me out on Twitter if you want there. So, I like to start out by discussing uh, a article that was published quite some time now in the Philosophical Review by Thomas Nagel. And it was titled, What is it like to be a bat? Now, Nagel was not a bat scientist. He was a, phil a philosopher, a philosopher um, and he studied philosophy. But even not being a bat scientist, he recognized that something about bats are just different. And I think probably most of us in attendance here have that intrigue, that curiosity about bats, because they live a life that is so different. Now, Nagel used the example of a bat to really talk about, as you can see in the, the article here, about consciousness and the experience of what is it like to be a human being? How can you empathize with other animals? And can you truly understand what it is to be a bat, to echolocate, to fly in the dark, to do all of these things. And he argued that the answer is no, actually. You can't truly know what it is like for another animal or for another human, for that matter, is, is his argument, what it is for that person to be that person or that animal to be that animal. But that doesn't stop us from trying. Um, and I, I think it's really telling that he chose bats as his example of something that is kind of other. And I've spent my career trying to do what Nagel said is impossible, which is 
to know what it is like to be a bat. And so I'm going to hopefully take you on a bit of a journey today to answer that question. And we're going to be looking at this mostly through the lens of the sensory perception of bats, uh, their echolocation and the different adaptations that go along with echolocation that really show it's not just a, a simple sensory system. There's so much that, that goes into it. So I'm going to start by giving an overview of the field uh, of echolocation and acoustics, again, at a fairly high level. And then I'm going to tell you three kind of vignettes about different research questions that I've been interested in over the years. The first being jamming, uh, the acoustic interference that goes on between prey and bats, and in some cases, bats with each other. Stealth echolocation, cases where bats will echolocate very quietly in order to either sneak up on their prey potentially or avoid being detected by other bats. And finally, the possibility that bats maybe are even flying completely in the dark without using echolocation. So I'd like to start with this video here, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the echolocation calls as well. Um, I, we tested it out earlier and it was a little bit quiet, but I'll play it for you. Okay, so these are high-speed videos um, that I've taken of bats in a flight tent, and hopefully you could see them flying. This is slowed down by about 30 times, and we've recorded the sounds that the bats are making with special ultrasonic microphones and dropped the frequency so that we can hear it, whether or not you can hear it uh, over the presentation. And so if you weren't able to hear it, um, the bat is flying through, making a chirp-like sound, and then there's a gap, another chirp, a gap, another chirp, and so on. Of course, this is their echolocation system that normally we can't hear because it's at too high of a frequency or too high of a pitch, but we've dropped that down into our own audible range. So echolocation, we all know generally what that is and, and how it works, but to dive into a little bit more detail, any echolocating animal or system for that matter, as engineers can design an echolocation or a sonar system, or has to be able to calculate three positions of a target. So we have the azimuth or the horizontal direction. We have the elevation or the vertical direction to the target. And we have the distance or how far away that object is, which we often refer to in the field as ranging. Now, what's really distinctive about echolocation is this last one, uh, the ability to determine the distance to objects with high precision. And the estimates are really astounding. Uh, they vary anywhere from maximum would be about a centimeter precision in determining the distance, all the way down to sub-millimeter precision, depending on the bat and the echolocation system and, and the experiments. So, they are astoundingly precise in their ability to do that. Um, and the reason why I say that that's really what's so distinctive about echolocation is that most mammals, at least, uh, most vertebrates, we can tell the direction to sound quite well, um, but we can't tell the distance with very good precision. So how do they do this? Um, the basic principle is, as we saw in the last video, they make an outgoing call, or sometimes we call that a pulse, and then they're listening. And of course, an echo bounces off of objects in the environment. That sound bounces off of objects in the environment, creates an echo that comes back. And their brain has, fires action potentials or responses that indicate the time of when the sound went out and when the sound came back. And with a little bit of math, knowing the speed of sound, um, we and their brain can calculate how far away that object is. And their brains are highly adapted for this particular task. They actually have specialized group of brain cells that are dedicated to doing this in their auditory cortex uh, that animals that don't echolate, uh, echolocate uh, do not have, at least to that, that extent to which it's dedicated. So it shows that their brain is hardwired for this task, which is really cool. 
Um, and in case you're curious about the math, uh, it's, it's there. All right, so echolocation, it's not just a static process, it's adaptive. Um, they're constantly changing various parameters of the echolocation calls to maximize information that they're getting back from their environment. So this is a, a video that's going to show the bats hunting insects. And hopefully you'll be able to hear those sounds and notice how they differ uh, when they're hunting versus when they're just echolocating. Okay, so you can see there's a lot going on there. Uh, we're also interested in my lab in the biomechanics of flight and how they contort their body around. They're using their entire wing to grab onto the moth. That's fairly typical that we often either see the moth, the bat grab the prey either with the wing or directly with the tail membrane and then into the mouth. As far as I'm aware, I have never seen clear documentation of bats capturing prey out of the air directly with their mouth. Um, they, as far as anything I've seen that's very clear, they always use some part of their wing or tail membrane. But as you could see there, or hopefully here, the bats are adjusting their echolocation. So when they detect an echo that comes back from a prey, they will start calling faster. And so the reason for that, uh, which you may be able to in, uh, intuitively figure out, is that every time they get an echo bat, it's like updating their sonar screen. And they get a new estimate of where that prey is. And so you could see, um, I can I'll actually play uh, this video out a little bit and we could see a couple other trials. Uh, this one in particular. There. So you could see the the bat actually didn't realize that it didn't catch the prey. So instead of uh, capturing the moth into its soft wing membrane, it hits it with its forearm bone and flings the prey up into the air. So just an error of maybe one centimeter is the difference in that bat capturing the prey versus that moth surviving and escaping. So, um, all of this is happening at once, and by echolocating very quickly, it's getting information back about the position of the prey uh, more rapidly to update its sonar screen, so to say. And that helps it be able to capture the prey, but it's obviously not always successful. So I am going to introduce uh, this concept or this figure here um, that that I think hopefully you all will be able to grasp. And many of you are probably already familiar with looking at these, but I'll walk you through uh, from the ground. So as acousticians, scientists who study sound, often we use uh, this graphing application called a spectrogram or a sonogram. So we take the sound and there is a mathematical formula basically that's applied to the sound to convert it so that we have this graph. And what we've done is on the x-axis, we have time in milliseconds. So this is less than half of a second of sound, 400 milliseconds or four tenths of a second. On the y-axis, what's really unique, we can see here that we can't see in a normal waveform is that now we can see the frequency information on the y-axis. And so you can see this goes from zero kilohertz or zero a kilohertz are thousands of cycles per second, up to, in this case, about 125 kilohertz. So here in North America, most bats are producing sound in the range of 20 to 125 kilohertz. Other places around the world where some of you are, bats can produce sound upwards of 200 kilohertz. And for context, the designated human upper hearing limit is somewhere around 20 kilohertz, the very bottom portion of this graph. So all of this 
uh, that's dem that's shown here are sounds that normally we would not be able to hear. But if we slow it down, that drops the pitch and we are able to hear it. So I'm gonna play this for you. And you can see each one of these dashes here is an echolocation call. And you'll see the red go along as hopefully you can hear it as well. Okay, so that is one third of a second. This entire sequence goes from a bat detecting its prey. It starts calling at a faster rate. And then at the end goes into what we call a feeding buzz. And if you're out into the field with uh, an echolocation recording device, if it's playing it, it often sounds like a, a z or a buzz sound. So that's why that scientist called this a feeding buzz, even though it's a trill at a very high rate. Aaron, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Tigger. We're not getting any sound. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I don't know. When you shared screen, did you click a share sound box and optimize for video? We were playing with that earlier. Um, I don't know. I don't have too many more acoustic recordings and hopefully okay. you can imagine what it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Just just letting you know. You Thank can you. do an imperson you can impersonation up. Yeah. Impersonation of the <laughs> exactly. like that. <laughs> Thank you, Tiga. Um yeah, I'm sorry the sound's not coming through, but um we'll just we'll just roll with it. Um so this kind of shows the dynamic nature of echolocation. And there are various other ways that bats are changing the sounds as they're detecting prey and responding, uh, moving through different environments. They're constantly slightly tweaking the sounds that they're making to optimally adjust and get the information back that they need uh, from the environment. All right, let me just check up uh, the... Okay, getting a lot of comments that uh, we can't hear the sound. So, sorry about that. I, I, I if we have more uh, that I've forgotten later on, I'll, I'll, I'll try to play with that. All right, so let's talk about bats as predators. I these are old numbers. I need to update this. <laughs> There's now over fourteen hundred species of bats. And estimated around 70% or so are purely insect eaters. So that gives you an idea that there's now close to probably a thousand species of bats on Earth that are pure insect eaters. And the distribution of bats, just like the distribution of people on this call, is pretty much all around the world, which is quite impressive. You have to go to some very unique locations to find places where there are not bats such as uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and certain very remote islands. But even many remote islands do have bats. And they are a primary, if not the primary predator of nocturnal flying insects. So if you think of this from a global perspective, basically if you're an insect flying around at night almost anywhere in the world, there's a very good chance that bats are present as one of, if not your primary predator. So this shows the kind of global context of these interactions that I'm gonna be talking about between bats and insects. Now, many different insects have evolved the ability to hear the echolocation calls of bats, which we, we know they're at specific frequencies and we could see that this ability has evolved more than 20 different times in very diverse groups. So we have insects on, on the screen here, all the way from lace wings, uh, various kinds of moths have evolved ears on different parts of their body. Uh, we have a praying mantis here, beetles, tiger beetles, katydids, crickets. And what's really cool is that these ears can be found all over the insect body plan. So just, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, there are ears that are on the wings, uh, the abdomen, the thorax, the mouth parts, uh, on beetles, they're in the kind of junction between the head and the thorax. Uh, in 
katydids and crickets, they're on their legs. So imagine walking around and as you walk, your ears are moving and hearing sound differently. So this shows to me how important this is, that it's evolved so many times in different kinds of insects. Now, a common example um, that scientists have studied are in moths or the Lepidoptera. And this is a, a fairly typical kind of moth that we might, might arrive at somebody's porch in the summertime. And if you looked very closely um, at this particular kind of moth, it's a noctuid, there is a little cavity on the underside just between the thorax and the abdomen. And if you zoomed way in there with a microscope like we have here, you'd see that they have an eardrum, basically. Uh, we, we call this a tympanum, but it's a fancy word for an ear or an eardrum. Now that structure itself looks very similar to our own ears um, on the outside, but there's a notable difference on the inside, which is that in many moth groups, there's only two neurons that are taking all of that information and giving everything that the moth has about its predator, two neurons. So for comparison, our own auditory system has somewhere on the order of magnitude of 20,000 neurons for processing sound. These moths can have two, in some cases, as few as one. So it's really remarkable. And this is showing the interactions between bats and moths in the night sky. And uh, go kind of briefly to describe this, but there's three different moths. So this was recorded with a time-lapse camera that was recording the tracks of three moths and a bat near a street light. Moth one and moth three here are hearing the sounds of the bat, but those sounds are coming in quietly such that this is indicating to the moth that the bat is still relatively far away. So those moths hear those sounds and simply turn away from the sound and try to get out of there, avoid an interaction um, at all. That's their first strategy. Moth two in the, mat in the middle was not so lucky. They hear the sounds of the bat. Those sounds are coming in fast. They are loud and they're coming quickly together, indicating to the moth that it is danger zone time. Those uh, calls are indicating that, that that bat is close. And so this moth executes a series of evasive maneuvers to try to escape the approaching bat. The bat doesn't give up so easily. It's pursuing and the shutter of the camera closes just before the moment of truth here. So we can't actually tell if the bat captures the moth, but it's not looking good for the moth. So this kind of illustrates what we often refer to as the bat insect evolutionary arms race. And this is the classic dynamics of the sort of dogfight pursuit and evasion that is going on above our heads all, all of the time. Now, there are some moths that have another strategy, and they have the ability to produce sound of their own. Now, this is a tiger moth, uh, which is in the group Arcteony, and there's actually over 10,000 species of this particular group of moths. And what unites them is this specialized structure on the side of their thorax, the side of their body, that's called a timbal. And I'll show you some videos of this, but this is a specialized sound producing organ. And if we zoom in on it on a electron microscope, on the surface, you can see this series of ridges. So on this one, there's about 20 or 30 of them that are along the surface. And this structure, it's very thin on the surface and it's filled with air. And there's a muscle underneath that contracts it and causes it to buckle inwards and then outwards, creating a series of ultrasonic clicks. And it's really a remarkable uh, structure. And hopefully that will come through as we start to study its sounds that it, that it makes. So the question that I was interested in for my PhD, as well as others were interested in before I was starting this, um, is why? Why produce sounds in response to a acoustic predator? And there's multiple hypotheses. Uh, some of which have very good evidence. 
And jumping to the chase, the, the answer in most cases appears to be that it's actually a warning to the bats that the moths are toxic. So for example, this moth here is the dogbane tiger moth, Cycnia tenera. You can see it's brightly white and yellowish colors. So as a caterpillar, these moths feed on toxic plants and the, 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 but, the caterpillars uh, sequester those toxins, they keep those toxins in their body, which make them very uh, disgusting to the bats. So if a bat catches one of these and starts to eat it, it will basically vomit out uh, the moth, it will spit out, it will take several minutes to clean its wings to get all of that off them. That's just how toxic they are. So what What's going on here is that the bats have really no way of necessarily knowing that ahead of time. And so by clicking, this moth, Cycnia tenera, can send a signal to the bats that they're toxic and it's a win-win. The bats don't have to deal with this toxic moth and the moth can go on uh, with its life. But there are other hypotheses that date back, actually all the way back to the 1960s, that had this idea that maybe the clicks of some moths could be interfering with the bat's echolocation system. This is what we refer to as the jamming hypothesis. So to be clear, in order to demonstrate jamming, there would have to be a clear indicator that the clicks themselves are in some way distorting the bat's perception through echolocation that makes it difficult for them to capture the prey. So this was a subject um, of my PhD work at Wake Forest University with uh, Bill Connor and Jesse Barber, among others who, who helped with this work. And uh, this is where it's helpful to know that not all moths are the same, not all moth clicks are the same. So we found this moth, Bertholdia trigona. It's a gorgeous little moth. Uh, the wings there are actually slightly transparent as well as having this orange and pink hues to it. Uh, they're found in Central America, in Mexico, as well as a few places in the United States. Uh, so we went down to Arizona. I was working in North Carolina at the time to a field station where uh, we figured out that we could find these moths. And why we're so interested in these moths is that they are champion sound producers. So this is their timbal organ. And I haven't really given you uh, much of a reference here. And now this does have sound. So I could, let me see. Let me try uh, share sound. There we go. Let me see. Uh, hopefully you can hear it now. Okay, can you hear that? Yes. Oh, yes. I should have done that earlier. Okay. So this is slowed down 30 times. And this is one of their timbal organs. They have two, one on the left and one on the right. And you can see this structure um, as it's buckling in, it's creating a burst of sound. As it's coming out, it's making a second burst of sound. Okay, so this is just showing one. When one of them is pausing to recoil, the other one is making sound. So it's basically completely filling time and the frequency space with noise. So this is pretty much an ideal potential jamming sound. So we figured if any moth could jam a bat, this is the one to do it. And we performed experiments in a flight room where we trained the bats to hunt moths that were actually hung from basically a little fishing line. So the moths are really at a disadvantage here because normally they could be flying around and evading. Um, in this particular case, uh, this video was taken uh, after the initial experiments. Hopefully, uh, well, this one's now not playing sound. Uh, but this is uh, one of the jamming moths, and the bat is coming in here. The moth does do a little bit of a dive maneuver. Um, I'm sorry, the sound issues. It normally is producing those clicks, and that makes it so that the bats, as we saw in the experiments, would 
that get very close to the prey, just like they do here, but then they miss their prey. And so we saw that time and time again. And we also, um, I don't have the, the graphs, but if you're curious, uh, I check out the publication. We looked at the acoustics of the bats and we saw that the clicks were disrupting that feeding buzz that we saw. The bat would go start to go into the feeding buzz, then the moth would start clicking and the bat would hear that and it would kind of disrupt its patterning. So we had direct evidence that the clicks were in fact interfering with the bat's echolocation. So this is really exciting. Uh, this was published way back in 2009, um, but this was the first really clear demonstration, as far as I'm aware, of any prey animal using acoustic interference or jamming as a defense strategy. So um, after studying that, uh, we actually went to the field. So th those experiments were done in the lab in North Carolina. We had the moths shipped to the lab where we could train the, the bats to do all this. But we're really curious, and I've always been interested in what the animals are doing more in nature. So we went out to the field uh, to start, see if we could figure out a way of putting out cameras and equipment that we could study animals in the natural environment. So this was done at the Southwestern Research Station a place I've now gone to 15 or so years uh, over the last couple of decades over the summer. For North America, at least, they have a high diversity and abundance of both bats and insects. So it's really an ideal kind of field laboratory for studying these kind of interactions. And this is one of our earlier field setups. So this is an a, a infrared camera on the left side of the screen and infrared lights. We have a little workstation where we can see the feeds. So I actually have three cameras. We can film interactions uh, that we concentrate in, in at our field location with these, in, these uh, ultraviolet lights. So we've made our own little kind of street lights here. It's very nice because this area otherwise is very dark. So having a light like this attracts lots of insects, lots of bats, and there's actually so much going on that it's uh, too much. It's difficult to know what you're even looking at. So what I learned early on is we set this up and you actually wait until about midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Once the party is kind of settling down, people are going home, people as in the bats and the moths, uh, from the party, and then you just have the stragglers at the bar, and there's just one or two moths kind of cruising through, and then the bats that have just learned uh, very quickly that this is the feeding ground, and they're just going back and forth, cruising, and then you can see an individual bat come through, pursue that prey, and we can film this with multiple cameras, see what's going on, map it in 3D space, and then we also have four microphones that we've put out so we can record any sounds that the bats are making. Or if we have uh, like jamming moths, for example, we can record the sounds that the moths are making. So this took quite a few years to kind of figure out how to do all of this in the field. Um, now I think the methodology is, is very well developed. We can do this quite readily, but 15 years ago when I was developing this setup with co colleagues and collaborators, there just wasn't really a methodology of like how do you how do you do this. So um, one of the great things about working in the field in one of these diverse places using equipment that people haven't really used is that you just record things kind of by accident almost, and that's what happened in this case. I started recording a, a call that to me was totally new and. Uh, I did find reference to somebody who recorded, I think the same call it was published in an obscure place, but they just kind of noted it. Nobody had really studied it before. And so um, I, I refer to these as SINFM calls uh, or sinusoidally frequency modulated calls, fancy word for just meaning that they go up and down in frequency in a kind of sinusoidal or oscillating pattern. And I started recording these just by accident. I actually didn't see them while I was in the field. I didn't know it was happening at the time. I think it was 
February, in the middle of winter, I was going through my recordings from the summer previous, and I was looking at the acoustics, and this sound just jumped up out at me. I was immediately really intrigued. And what amazed me was, one, that structure that I had never really seen before, and two, that, as you can see in this example, the there's two bats actually making sounds. One is making these sine FM calls and the other one is making a feeding buzz. So behind it, you can hopefully see these kind of dashes that are going more vertically and speeding up. Those are the feeding buzz of another bat. And the first one I looked at looked just like this. There's the feeding buzz and the sine FM calls. They're at the same time, the same frequency. And I just looked at them like, these these bats are jamming each other. This is wild. I, I couldn't really believe it, to be honest. I had never even heard of anybody suggesting that bats actively jam each other's signals. So I looked at that file and I was really amazed. And I tried to calm myself down and say, you know, it's probably just chance that it was working out that way. Probably never going to see that again. And I advanced through my acoustic recordings a few more and I see another one, same exact pattern. And then another one, and then another one. I went through all my recordings, and I had something like 50 recordings, and in almost every case, it was this same pattern. Now, that's not enough to demonstrate that the bats are in fact jamming each other, but it was enough to set me on a quest to study this. And I'm gonna give you the very short version, but basically the next five years of my life were dedicated to getting funding, designing experiments, going back out to the field to do the experiments to test this idea that bats are actually jamming each other's echolocation. So the first question that probably arises, why? Why would the bats be jamming each other? Um, and my hypothesis looking at this is that it has to do with prey, that it's a feeding competition strategy. And one bat is presumably, because it's doing a feeding buzz, would be pursuing an insect. The other one would be jamming it in order to prevent its competitor from capturing the insect. And then that would give the jamming bat a chance to capture the prey. Now, I tried to think of other hypotheses, as a good scientist does. Uh, what else could this be used for? Um, could be jamming, um, or it could be there's some evidence in the literature and more actually since then that bats will make food claiming calls. So these are calls where one bat is simply communicating to the other bat, hey, that one's mine. Don't mess with it. Don't get that moth or I'm going to beat you up, basically. Um, that's a food claiming signal. So in some cases that does happen. But in those cases, it's usually not this late. It's not when the other bat is doing a feeding buzz. Um, but that's certainly a possibility. Um, I also thought maybe it was a, it could be a cooperation. Uh, maybe the bats are working together in some way. And this signal is disrupting the prey's ability to avoid the predator. So um, we set out our different hypotheses and design experiments to, to test those in the field. Um, that is published. The links are on my website if you want to check that out. But the, the short version is that, um, I set up this even more elaborate field recording apparatus where this is me up on a two-story scaffolding tower. And I didn't mention, but these bats, uh, th this was these were being made by Mexican freetail bats, which you may be familiar with. They create huge colonies in the southern parts of the United States. And they fly up very fast. They fly high off the ground. So they're difficult to study. They wouldn't come down to our lights. So we went up to them. And I just set, got our whole setup and moved it up. So I have a three-story tall uh, tower here uh, with an ultraviolet light. And I have a camera that I was using to spotlight the bats. At the time, that was the only way I could come up with to actually see what the bats were doing and if they were actually catching prey or hunting prey. And I have that synchronized with cables down to the ground with an eight microphone array on the ground. So we could triangulate the positions to the bats 
from these microphones to know, look at their flight pattern and know which individuals are doing what acoustically. And basically what we found is that when two bats are present and one of them is making this sign FM call, indeed the capture success of the other bat dramatically went down. So this does demonstrate that it's some sort of competition strategy, that it's preventing the other bat one way or another from capturing the prey. Now we don't can't say that that was jamming yet. So um, before I, uh, sorry, actually, before I get to that, this is showing an example of the mapping. So you can really see that this is a competitive kind of battle interaction. And the red bat is coming through here. The numbers indicate time in seconds and the circles indicate echolocation calls. So the red bat is coming in here and then it does a feeding buzz trying to capture the prey. The blue bat does a sign FM signal. The red bat misses. And then basically they go back and forth. They're weaving into this same spot and missing the prey. And then finally, after three, four rounds back and forth, then the blue bat has a chance to capture the prey. The red bat kind of gives up and the blue bat does successfully capture the prey. So this is really illustrating that this is a comp competition between the bats, but still it's not quite demonstrating jamming. It, it seemed likely to me based on the acoustics, um, but we hadn't completely demonstrated that it was jamming. So we did another experiment where we did playbacks. So to see if we could basically jam the bats ourselves. So in this case, I have a moth that again, I've basically tethered or tied uh, very carefully to a very fine fishing line that the bats can't really detect and lure the bats in. The, the bats come swooping down to capture, try to capture the moths. And then I'm sitting down at the ground at the table watching all of this. And when I see a bat come, I have a speaker that's connected to a trigger on the ground and it's randomly picking different kinds of playbacks. Some that are uh, designed in certain ways that it should be able to jam the bat if jamming is possible. And some where the frequency has shifted or the timing has shifted such that it shouldn't interfere with the bats. And the short of it is that the predictions matched. When we played the right sound at the right time, the bats would swoop down, they'd try to capture the moths, but they would miss. Uh, when we played a sound a little too early or at the wrong frequency, then the bats would basically ignore it and capture the prey. So this demonstrated that indeed uh, this, this appeared to be a jamming signal, which again was really cool uh, to my knowledge. Uh, it's still the only demonstration in nature of animals uh, actively, basically, you know, ad adaptively or trying to jam each other as a food competition strategy. So um, still something that blows my mind, the fact that, that, that's, that that even goes on. Okay, um, so that covers the first couple uh, vignettes here. Let's see how we're doing on time. Um, does anybody feel free to drop in the in the chat any questions that you have? Um, I do have uh, another kind of couple little pieces here to talk about. And I know we only have about 15 more minutes, so I'm going to keep going, but I will keep an eye out on the chat. So please drop your questions in there and, and we'll see uh, what we have time for. So um, with our last bit of time here, I want to talk about stealth echolocation. So stealth echolocation is defined in the literature as bats, in this case, echolocating quietly as an adaptation to avoid being detected by other animals. So that could be their prey, it could be other bats. And if you think about it, you know, as an animal that's out there as a predator, as a potential prey to owls or other animals, as very social animals, there's a number of situations where echolocation is giving off a lot of information that bats may not want to be giving off. Um, they don't necessarily want their prey or a competitor to know that they're there. 
So in certain situations, it could be beneficial for bats to go quiet or adjust their signals in ways that makes it more difficult for other competitors or prey to detect that they're there. So this gets to a question of the co-evolution of bats and insects. So scientists have thrown this idea of an arms race or co-evolution of predator and prey around for a long time, but to find really clear evidence that bats have co-evolved strategies in response to their prey is actually been very difficult. So people have had various ideas of sort of strategies that the predators could have in response to the prey. Now, it's clear that prey have evolved adaptations as defenses to the predators, uh, as we talked about. That Nobody really de denies or doubts that prey are adapting to the predators. But even beyond bats, there's not that many examples where it's super clear that the predator has evolved a specific strategy to overcome the prey's defenses. And that is what is required if we really want to call this co-evolution. We need what we call reciprocal or back and forth adaptations. And so people have found cases where bats are using echolocation calls that are at super high frequencies or super low frequencies, for example, that make it difficult for the prey to detect the bat's echolocation. And people have suggested, scientists have suggested and even demonstrated an advantage to those strategies for the bats. But that's not quite enough evidence to demonstrate coevolution. The reason being that there could be other advantages, and there certainly are uh, other advantages to echolocating at a very high frequency or at a very low frequency. Um, high frequencies give you a better spatial imaging of, of your environment and low frequencies travel further. So there's always the possibility that that's why those sounds evolved and that their benefit in predator prey interactions is really secondary, that there was not a clear evolutionary pressure on the predator. So we need, a system where there's no other advantage to that strategy other than in the predator-prey interaction. This is where stealth echolocation comes into play. And the reason being that stealth or echolocating quietly really doesn't have many other benefits. Now, bats will echolocate more quietly when they are flying close to vegetation or in a cave so that they don't blast themselves with echoes. But if we can demonstrate that bats are using these quiet sounds in an environment where it's not advantageous to be quiet and it's giving them that, that benefit in predator-prey interactions, then that would be a very strong at argument in favor of this co-evolution hypothesis. So we set out to study this and in order to do this, we're interested in, in breaking this up into two questions. First is how loud are the bats actually uh, when they're attacking the prey particularly? And how does this difference in being quiet affect the outcomes of the predator-prey interactions? So we studied this. Uh, again, this was in Arizona. This was uh, near a place where we knew where these bats were. And we tried to find a spot where we could kind of hide in amongst the rocks and again, dangle a prey out where the bats would be flying and see if we could get them to hunt the prey in the fields. And then the part that we added here is a very small microphone that we suspended down that could record the sounds that the moth would be hearing. And then we can film it and reconstruct the flight trajectories of the bats in 3D and then uh, calibrate that so we know how loud the bats were actually being. And to just jump to the results, again, this is published if you want to check it out for yourself. Uh, this particular bat, this is, and I, I may not have mentioned it, although it was on the slide, is Townsend's big-eared bat, Corynorhinus townsendii. And they're about 20 to 45 decibels quieter than other bats in the same environment, 
which is a dramatic difference. And uh, when we did the experiments to see how this affected prey, this is what it looked like. So this is a control moth, uh, a moth that can hear the bat and a loud bat. So hopefully you can hear the echolocation calls. And so that is a different species. That one is echolocating more normally. And you could see that the moth does a nice diving maneuver to escape. Now, when we did the same thing, but now with our quiet bat, Townsend's bigger bat, um, here is the moth. The bat comes in. You can barely hear the bat's echolocation because it's so quiet. And it just comes in and scoops up the prey, grabs it. And we almost never saw a clear evasive response. If anything, maybe one of those early responses where the prey is just kind of gradually flying away. But we basically almost never saw those really dramatic diving maneuvers. We also had moths that could click in response to the prey, and we never detected the moths clicking in response to the predators. So here are some of the numbers, um, but just in summary, all the predictions held out. And the main, the main cost of this to recognize is that the bats can only detect their prey at a much shorter distance. So these Townsend's bats that are echolocating so quietly, they can only pick up the echoes at a very short distance, um, less than a meter compared to three meters. Um, but their capture success is higher, the prey are not exhibiting defenses, and they're echolocating more quietly. So all the predictions we had in place uh, were being supported that this is in fact a evolutionary countermeasure to the prey's hearing. Now, the story doesn't totally end there. Um, there's been some recent work in this area, and, and some people are kind of arguing mechanistically about some constraints I don't really have time to get into, but a paper is, was just published earlier this year. It's kind of arguing against this coevolution. I still think it's coevolution, but it, the debate in the scientific community uh, continues. All right, um, I, I know we're kind of uh, running out of time here, so let me check the chat and see what questions uh, people are having here. Okay. Uh, where might the term linked coevolution fit into these interactions? Does it differ from calling it coevolution? I'm honestly not familiar with the term linked evolution. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. But if you send me uh, a paper or something where people are discussing that, I would be curious. Sometimes people do have kind of subtle differences where they're where we're talking about evolution. Um, so, but I'm, I'm not, I, I have not come across that particular term linked evolution. Um, Bernice is asking, might low amplitude calls also result in energy savings for the bat? Great question. And in general, the answer seems to be no. The reason being that bats, when they echolocate, they synchronize their echolocation calls with their wing beat and with their breathing cycle. So, they don't, generally speaking, need to produce a lot of energy to echolocate because most of that is coming from their flight muscles. That as they're beating down, for example, they're using that to sort of collapse or contract the muscles of, of their, their rib cage and their lungs to expire. So they have this very efficient system where echolocating quietly is probably not saving them much energy because it's already so efficient. It's possible they could be spending a little bit more energy uh, when they're doing really high calling rate echolocation calls. Um, but in general, that, that metabolic cost is not super high. All right, Donald is asking slightly off topic, but related to Bernice's question, does production of harmonics require extra energy? That is a really interesting question. And I can't say that I know the answer to that question. Um, it does bring me the opportunity to say that just in the last year or two, um, have we really fully understood how bats produce ultrasound? 
And this was a discovery actually that uh, Jonas Hawkinson, who's um, been working in my lab, um, I was not part of that work, um, but with Kuhn Elements, uh, studied this to demonstrate how bats produce ultrasound. And on their larynx, the, they have these laryngeal folds with a secondary, a uh, very small kind of flap on it. And it had been hypothesized for a long time that this secondary kind of flap on the laryngeal folds is responsible for the ultrasound production because it has to oscillate at such a high frequency. And they demonstrated indeed that that, that, that was involved. Um, so I wouldn't think that producing harmonics necessarily requires extra energy, um, but I can talk to the people who study that. Um, to see if they have any thoughts. All right, people are leaving and saying thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I didn't quite get through to the end to talk about silence and other things, uh, but there are resources on my website. And I think I'll just kind of cut it off there. If there's if, if people want to hang around and have any more questions, um, we can we can hang out there. But um, I'll just wrap up by saying thanks again for coming and tying back to the introduction. Hopefully this gives you a glimpse of what it's like to be a bat and just how dynamic these animals are and how intricate all of this coevolution. When you think about the incredible diversity of over 1400 species of bats, all of the coevolution, all of the inter interactions, I am sure we are just barely scratching the surface of what's happening all around us and all around the world. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Erin. And I completely agree. I, I feel like the more that I learn about bats, the more I'm just like, we know nothing. <laughs> it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful stockpile of unknowns. Uh, and, and so interesting because bats like, they're, they're just like no other critter out there really. Uh, and you, your talk definitely demonstrated that we are, have barely scratched the surface in understanding, uh, in understanding bats and how they interact with the world. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for your talk. And, um, again, all of this is going to be posted up onto our YouTube channel afterwards. So if there's something you wanted to go back and learn more about, um, or go back and, and, um, hear about references, you can always go back and do that. And again, Aaron mentioned many times that all of his publications are available on his website. So go check out some of his papers. They are absolutely fascinating. I could not recommend them, recommend them enough. Uh, so without further, without, I guess, anything else, unless we have more questions uh, in the chat at all, uh, he didn't even get to talk about ear size. <laughs> Ears matter. For <laughs> Uh, and again, just a quick reminder, our next GBAT webinar, My Field for Dummies speaker, is going to be Caitlin Campbell, and she is going to be talking about using stable isotopes and different types of stable isotope analysis to understand bats. Uh, so whether it's from movement to foraging ecology, stable isotopes can be used for a lot of different things. So if you're interested, please use the registration link that is going to be posted next week to sign up for that talk. Otherwise, we can give one big hearty thank you one more time to uh, Dr. Co uh, Cochran, and we can go ahead and tune out for the day. Thank you all so much for spending your time here today. Yeah, thank you.